you have me um, share my screen here? I, you should be able to. Um, is that working? Yes, that looks great. Okay. All right. Um, thanks, Ashley, for let me speak here. Um, I've only been here for about a year, um, having a great time. Got to know a few people and um, seen a little bit of the orchards out here. So I don't have uh, the year of the pandemic. I don't have any major findings, but I just wanted to review with everyone what what we are working on and what we have found in uh, in the last in the last growing season. So so our key suspects here are um, Scylla, BMSB, SWD, and leafhoppers are the kind of the main focus of the lab so far. I'm just going to run through some basics and what we've what we've been doing. So parasilla management is um, as I came out here, you know, I thought this would be uh, there'd be a lot of earth shattering things to research, but um, really things haven't changed a lot since the 80s when Larry Goot, my major professor from MSU, was out here getting his master's and his PhD. Um, a lot of the same things are still hold true. You know, the, the community organization and the impacts of beneficial insects and natural enemies has been well described by Helmut Riedel and Larry Goot and people well before I got here. So what we've been focusing on is just trying to get back to basics and trying to maybe refine some of these tools. Um, I know there's a different camp of people in Washington that have different challenges and, and rely more on chemistries than, than we do down here in, in Oregon. So we're trying to figure out how we can serve both of those different philosophies or pest management approaches. So I've reached out and tried to collaborate broadly with people that are, that are already um, well underway with their research programs. One of the things that we're focusing on here in our lab is working with crop consultants who already have kind of these natural enemy action thresholds in their mind about when growers need to do some corrective action and when they don't. So we, uh, we're gonna make some lures here in the lab and try to trap those natural enemies and work towards putting some numbers on these action thresholds that crop consultants already have kind of a gut feel for. So that, that's gonna be the main focus of our lab um, rather than taking a chemical approach, but we're also working with Rodney Cooper to understand, to do some gut content analysis, to understand where Scylla go in the winter and better understand their movements to and from the orchard. I have some trials here that I'm replicating for Louis Nottingham, um, looking at fall surround sprays so that uh, to see how well we get early season control when those are applied in the um, post harvest. Um, seems to be, we seem to be getting some really good early results. Um, and then we're work, I've been working with Rebecca Schmidt Jeffries, who's trying to improve some of these monitoring tools for Trichnites, a parasitic wasp, to um, again, try to understand how much impact natural enemies are having. Um, so, so we'll continue to do some silo research. The other major uh, hot topic here has been BMSB. Obviously, an invasive pest. There's it's a there's a national effort to try to track its movement and understand how to better control it. It's it's a tricky pest because it's a landscape level pest. It moves in and out of the orchard freely and is just as happy outside your orchard on wild species as, as it is on on your cultivated pears. The life cycle is um, well understood. There's uh, early season here. Females will come out, lay eggs. There's five instars. All of them feed on the same uh, host. They move around to the orchard. Uh, the female come in, lay eggs, and then those nymphs will feed, leaving corky um, damage on the pears, as shown here. Washington is been uh, taking a citizen science approach and, and then tracking um, its distribution. There's a, obviously there's a lot of um, sightings in the suburbs, very fewer in the agricultural regions, 
which are indicated in red dots. Um, but it has, there has been, especially in white salmon, there's been a bunch of sightings in the last few years. So the numbers are building and they're moving from the suburbs out into the agricultural regions. Oregon has taken a kind of a county, a different approach where we're just highlighting counties where we've confirmed sightings. The red and blue map is a habitat suitability map uh, that we're working, I'm working with Nick Wyman in his lab to validate this suitability, habitat suitability map. Um, we've probably need to update the county map. I'm sure there's any place we've got agricultural crops, um, this, this pest is bound to show up. So before I came to Oregon, I was part of this national study um, with the SCRI grant where we compared traps. So I just wanted to kind of review that data, but they did a trap comparison in 18 states across the country, looking at these two main traps that have a different price point, different needs for space and work to set them up and um, they catch a little bit differently. So I just wonder quickly, we're gonna review those findings. This was published in 2020, Journal of Economic Entomology. This top graph that I'm showing you is the Great Lakes region. And you can see that the two traps catch, the pyramid trap catches about twice as many and it catches a little bit, we find it catches a little bit earlier. The sticky card and stake seems to be the most popular trap in, in the way that the group that is tracking BMSB is, is trying to steer people. I think it's a much cheaper trap, but it doesn't catch nearly as many stink bugs, which may or may not be important depending on how you're managing your orchard. For whatever reason, in the Pacific Northwest, um, this pyramid trap catches about seven times as many um, as, the, as the sticky card. I think it's just a much more easy to find target and depending on how you place it in the orchard, stink bugs end up um, flying to it much more readily. So, so I, I'm, as I'm setting up my traps, I'm, uh, even though the group is kind of, the national advice is use this sticky card and a little one inch stake, I'm using the pyramid traps because I think they catch higher volume and a little bit earlier in the season. And so I started to set up some traps. We started in white salmon and then we spread them out all through the um, fruit loop here. And we're hoping, and we're tracking catch. Um, there's a, we're catching trap throughout, catching, sorry, tracking catch throughout the region. And we're hoping to push this data out to growers to just keep people informed and help crop consultants be aware of where hot spots are. You can see we have a hot spot there on a, on a particular orchard. Um, that grower has peaches, which is a stink bug's favorite crop. So, so that particular spot is going to be an area of focus for us. I submitted a grant and got approval for funding for rearing the Trisocus japonicus. So we're going to start our releases there in that hot spot. Um, this is a spray efficacy chart from developed in Michigan. I know, I think Lanate is not on the list here approved in Oregon, but currently we wanna recommend if you're doing a corrective spray, if you're catching numbers of stink bugs and you're concerned, only use excellent products. Um, the good and suppressive in lab studies, the stink bugs can recover and get up and keep, keep moving after they've been hit by a direct contact or some of these other chemistries. So, so stick to the ones that are rated excellent and, um, and we'll try to, we'll, hopefully my lab can keep people informed and we can target those sprays only when you see nymphs. Um, and we know that females are laying eggs in the orchard. So this is, uh, this is another project that we're working on. This is my insectary. We're working on building those numbers and we will be rearing the parasitic wasp that attacks the eggs. Nick Wyman and his student, Claire Donahue, are already working on this. We're gonna augment their releases and increase the number of sites where we're releasing this. And then hopefully we're gonna monitor its establishment over the next couple of seasons. And 
we've got some pretty high hopes for this control method. Um, in its home range, the this parasitic wasp can impart 60 to 80 percent control um, of stink bugs, so of the brown marmorated stink bugs. So we're so we're hopeful, and Claire, Nick's student, has had good results, and we're hoping to just kind of increase those numbers and expedite the release of this wasp. So those are the main focuses that we're working on here is increase monitoring and improve monitoring tools and increase the number of biological control release sites um, over the next couple of seasons. So we'll, we'll keep everyone posted and hopefully we can increase the number of uh, trapping sites that we have moving forward. So the next pest I'm gonna to switch to is spotted wing drosophila. This is Michigan data. We had a statewide monitoring network for spotted wing drosophila. And um, you can see over the, diff the various years, um, we we're able to track when the numbers really start to build in the orchard. And with those trend lines, we can kind of time when we really need to be worried about spotted wing drosophila moving into cherry orchards. Depending on the timing, some of the tart cherries that they grow in Michigan um, didn't need sprays at all. If they held off and they really watched monitoring traps closely, there was a couple of years where they didn't need to use a controlled spray at all. Uh, we're not finding that out here in Oregon, but we're, but we're working on the same kind of thing. There was just a article in Good Fruit Grower News about Nikki Rothwell doing some fruit susceptibility work. And I worked with her on in Michigan on that. So we're doing that here in Oregon. I've, we're looking at four key varieties and we're trying to figure out when SWD, when the fruit is really vulnerable to SWD infestation. And the idea here is um, we don't want to do any extra sprays that are just kind of prophylactic or just making you making you feel good um, because you're worried. So we really want to dial in when fruit is susceptible and when it is not so that we can shave off hopefully some of those early season sprays that, that are really unnecessary. This is what some of that work looks like. We're picking Skeena, Regina, Bing, and Sweethearts, kind of um, taking those samples and putting them into bins to try to classify what the orchard is mostly what stage it's at. Um, and then putting flies on those fruits to show hopefully that, um, take that Regina there and on June 15th, most of those fruit are not usable by female SWD. But the following week, things have moved pretty rapidly and, and those fruit are probably susceptible. So we're, we're in year two of that research and we're hoping to produce some, some numbers that are kind of quantifying fruit development and fruit vulnerability so that we can make better use of the chemical tools that we have. Um, once the fruit's susceptible, you have to protect it every, every seven days. Um, so we're, we're hoping we can make things a little bit more efficient for growers. We did um, one particular orchard that's on the far side of the Dalles felt like it was really isolated without any refugia outside the orchard or other resources. And so we did an extensive trapping network in this one particular orchard because there's some valleys, some low spots where there's some blackberries. I was hoping to show that maybe the flies all move out of the orchard, but we didn't actually find that. What we found there is post-harvest, the fly numbers are just huge. Um, up to 30,000 flies all the way through October in this particular orchard. So, so, you know, that's not something we've seen in Michigan. Usually once the fruit is gone, the flies kind of leave and move out to other resources. Something else is going on here in, in Oregon. So we're trying to continue to figure that out. Um, I think there's an opportunity for post-harvest sprays um, to try to knock down those winter morphs and reduce the numbers going into spring. Um, we have uh, Columbia Gorge Fruit Growers has funded a trapping network that I'm taking over from Ashley. And this is a map of all of those trapping sites. 
So there's an extension trapping network. We're hoping to refine this and streamline it and make it more useful and push that out to growers so that people have a sense of um, area wide what's happening in orchards and so that we can all be a little bit more responsive to building populations. Um, so stay tuned, more to come from that. But this year, we're gonna hopefully increase the number of trapping sites, but you see it's already really extensive trapping network, but we're gonna hopefully make it a little bit more user-friendly. Um, so there's still a lot of work to be done on SWD. We're, I've partnered with a lot of different groups. Um, we're trying to throw everything in the kitchen sink at this pest. So we're working on a company that's developing a camera trap for early detection. Jane Ali at USDA has worked on a non-nutritive sugar as an attracting kill. <clears throat> um, Vaughn Walton developed this decoy. We're doing some research with Vaughn and his lab to better understand how that tool works here in cherry orchards. Um, I'm working with Agrogene, which is a technology, which is a company that's developing CRISPR-Cas9 technology to produce sterile insects. And we're hoping that that um, is approved for release here in the next few years. Uh, started working with Parca as a, they've got a Cultiva, has a product called Parca and it's a skin thickener for hull split that I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, but we also think it provides some protection against females being able to overposit. So we're gonna start some of that research this summer. Stay tuned, there's a lot of good things coming. Hopefully we add to the toolkit and um, we can find a couple more tools to throw at this um, really problematic fly. So the other thing that the lab's focused on um, is cherry X disease. The uh, Tobin is really leading the way with his task force and he's really made some huge progress on developing some better understanding about what plants are vectoring this phytoplasm. We're partnering with him and sending him some leaf hoppers so that we can better understand the low titer transmission and, and which insects are responsible. Um, the life cycle is um, kind of slow. The leafhopper has to feed on an infected plant. It takes some time before that moves to their gut wall and in their hemolymph and then back to the salivary gland. So there's a, there's a window of time for us to react to those leafhoppers before they become infected. At some point, they, that phytoplasm does move to their salivary gland and then they can transmit it to new trees in the orchard. Those trees have a latency period where they may not show symptoms for one or two years, sometimes three years. And then that doesn't show up until you, the fruit is, is obviously in, um, smaller and shriveled and discolored. So scouting is key in identifying those problematic trees and Ashley's talked extensively about this. So we're, from an entomology standpoint, we're, we know from the literature, some of the key suspects that we're looking for. So when we got out here, we dug into the literature, talked to Tobin and, and kind of targeted some of these known vectors and started sampling. So we weren't sure how best to do this. So we picked a bunch of sites uh, here at the center in Mosier and all over the Dalles. We put up sticky cards and we did sweep netting um, just to see if we could identify who's out there. And what we found was um, a little surprising, I guess. We're still trying to unpack what it means. So sticky cards are the easiest um, way to monitor. We put these up at about a meter up in the tree, about three feet up in the tree and, and um, just come back in a week and check on them. And we found lots of different variety uh, species, but m most of that species diversity came from the Mosier site. Um, and we also went out and sw did sweep netting. And when we sweep net, we found these, uh, this variegatus, which is the, the one on the, the brown one, we found that one much, much earlier in April in really high numbers. And those didn't show up in, in the sticky cards. And then throughout the season, um, the graph on the right shows that we sweep netting catches many more of this 
um, the Scalidius variegatus all through the season. And we also catch these other two species, the C. geminatus and C. reductus, um, but in much lower numbers, they're really small. So what does this mean? We, we really don't have an accent, action threshold. The key treatment is to remove infected trees to prevent further spread. But we're, but we're working to better understand the phenology out here in the Dalles. Um, but from our first year of data, the, this Esclidius variegatus is our number one. It far outstrips the, all the other species in sheer quantity. So in Washington, Tobin's group has identified these, these Caledonis species as their key targets that they're looking for. And he's described the little pirate face and how to kind of make a quick identification. Out here in the Dalles, it looks like um, this one on the left is the one that we're going to find in greatest abundance. And so moving forward, we're just going to try to better understand how it moves from the, the grass strips and the weeds and offsite hosts and into the cherry orchard. And if we can better understand when it's moving into cherry trees or if it's going there by accident, and then we're hoping to improve some of the monitoring tools so we can tell scouts how best to track these numbers. Um, the sticky card is, uh, I think, the easiest way, but I think it's missing part of the population. And we're maybe missing an opportunity to react and, and try to control it. So, so more to come there. We're, we're still trying to understand how best to, to approach this. But, but for now, as Ashley's um, talked about numerous times, the number one thing to do is identify and remove infected trees. Our group is hopefully going to improve monitoring tools and action thresholds and try to understand the phenology, try to better um, time sprays, post-harvest sprays, see if we can double up and hit leafhoppers and SWD because I think we need to maybe attack both of those pests. And then we're going to look at some cultural controls. If we can understand non-cherry host plants and try to remove those from the environment, um, maybe we can reduce the speed of transmission. So that concludes the kind of the over, overview of what we're working on right now. Um, I'd love to get feedback from people, um, make sure that we're addressing needs and solving problems. Um, but we're trying to, trying to get in to every insect pest that we are aware of and collaborate with everyone in the Pacific Northwest and beyond to try to bring solutions to the, to the team and to the group out here. And hopefully, hopefully we can learn a little bit more about some of these pests and, and bring some tools that work for everyone. And I think, sorry, that was really brief, but I can, I can figure out how to stop sharing. I can take questions. Oh, yeah, we'd love to get some questions for Chris now. We've got one question that came in. You mentioned post-harvest surround. Did you apply that last year at McCarrick? Uh, not at McCarrick. That photograph is a grower cooperator who applied that for us. And that was applied in October. Is that right? Yes, it was, it was last fall. The trees don't look as white as they do, um, as they did at application. Um, but I just did a sample in there last week and um, I didn't run the stats on it, but you really don't need to. The, the difference between the treatment and the control is night and day. There's huge numbers in the control and in the surround plots, there's hardly any. So Could you remind everybody what you were applying that oh, surround for, Chris? Oh, sorry. Yeah, thanks, Ashley. It's um, so it's a kale and clay spray, and it um, coats the tree in a really sticky, clumpy, um, just or just a natural clay product that um, is designed to delay egg laying or prevent egg laying for parasilla. Um, and what Louis started doing is asking if we could apply it because of the early season rains and the orchard being maybe sometimes full of snow and a little bit slick and dangerous to drive a tractor through. If we applied it post-harvest in the fall, 
as late as possible, will it still impart some effect, even though there's a, been a bunch of rain events that are potentially washing a lot of it off? And what we're finding, and Louis has more data than I do, I'm just getting involved with Louis and helping Louis. Um, what we're finding is that yes, the answer is yes. The, there's still a big impact. I'm gonna do probably this week or next some egg, um, gonna collect data and count eggs, but the number of adults is, is greatly reduced. And so it's a good kind of preventative control tactic. I think it works for organic orchards and um, seems to do a great job. So can you uh, discuss how the, what the rates of this round were, um, how it was applied, one app, two? He did, um, you're gonna test my memory. We did a hundred pounds per acre, Is that right? And we did one, I think he had to drive, I think he drove up and back to get uh, full coverage, but he did one application but he just did it in both directions so that the, um, he didn't leave a, a bare spot on the tree. Um, is that right? The, uh, I, have to look at my, I have to look at my notes. You caught me. I want to say 100 pounds. I think that's just a standard rate. Spray volume, 100 gallons per acre at... 50 pounds, yeah, 100 pounds per acre. I think that's the standard recommended rate. And it doesn't, the trees don't look as white now in the spring, but um, they're still they're still in effect. At their scale, they still don't like it. They can tell it's there. So do you think we will be able to change spray timings for SWD given the timing we need to start our sprays for cherry fruit fly? I hope the answer is yes. I think that Nikki Rothwell in Michigan and my last year's data <clears throat> indicate that we can, based on fruit development, we can identify when the fruit is not usable by SWD. And so it's possible that we can, for some varieties that mature a little later, we can shave off some of those early sprays and hopefully starts, I mean, once we get um, Western cherry fruit fly, we need to protect, but some of those earlier sprays may not be, may not be needed. And so, yes, I'm hoping those sprays kind of link up and we can kind of do a two for one spray. But I, I you know, the, every variety is a little bit different and every season is going to be a little different. It's going to depend on how fast things ripen and the heat units that the trees experience. Do you want to talk a little bit about the changes you and I are interested in making to the trapping network and we can see if we get any hate mail or oh, if sure, like sure. it? Yeah, yeah. So the, so the, um, could I, since we have time, since I finished so early. Oh, here it is. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share that again. And then Am I sharing the right screen, Ashley? Yep, I can see the map. Um, it's in so, presenter view, so they don't have it. They can see the PowerPoint, basically. That's okay. Um, so the trapping network was set up before I got here, before Ashley got here, I think. <clears throat> and the intent at the time was to discover where SWD numbers were. We just wanted to see where it was showing up and how big the population was. So. SWD traps were placed all over the place. Cherries, apricot, you can see the list there. Um, in backyards, um, roadside ditches. We just wanted to know where it was. Now that we know that it's here and it's everywhere and it's well established, what I'd like to do, um, and I want to run this by the group, I have a meeting with the Columbia Gorge Fruit Growers to, to run it by them to make sure everyone's on board, is I really want to make it just for growers. I don't think it's any informative anymore to know populations in someone's backyard. And I, I don't want to single people out for, you know, having their house toilet papered or whatever, you know, blamed for the problem. The problem is it's global. SWD is all over the planet now. It's not anyone's fault. So what I'd really like to do is focus on cherry orchards 
And when numbers start to build in orchards, I'd like to push that data out to the group so that people can be on the lookout in their own orchard and decide based on the variety they're growing whether they need to take action or not. So I'd like to just streamline it and take out, maybe we don't need to track blackberries and backyards and, and nectarines. And something you talked about, Chris, which I think is really interesting, it might be interesting for the group, especially some of the um, some of the field reps from chemical companies is how do we make a way that you can easily quantify SWD in your individual orchard and do like a tailgate count? Is that something you're still interested in working on? And what would that look like? So yeah, so some of these, uh, you saw some of the numbers we we're catching, you know, 10,000 SWD in one orchard, you know, in, in October. So it's not productive, I think. It's not a good way to for the Columbia Gorge Fruit Grower group to spend their money to have somebody sit at a scope and count every single fly. So as long as everyone's on board, I think it makes much more sense to estimate the relative abundance of SWD and then do some kind of um, subsampling to, to verify that they're out there. We catch a lot of non-target. For people who haven't seen a trap, it is just, it's a very generic lure and it catches all kinds of fruit flies, house flies, beetles, all kinds of garbage. And so we this year are working on trying to just kind of streamline this process, look at just SWD, or I mean, look at just fruit flies, estimate probably half of this population is SWD. And instead of dissecting every one of them and looking for those key characteristics, just kind of eyeballing, yep, there's a bunch of males with spots on their wings. We can see that. Anybody can see that um, from a sample on the back of their truck. You don't need to positively ID everybody. We know they're here. If we're relying on a trapping network and I'm subsampling on the microscope, I think the whole group can kind of be aware to start paying attention. Is, is that, did I describe that right, Ashley? I, I want to get away from trying to count every single fly because we don't have an action threshold right now. It's, you know, as soon as your fruit is, fruit is vulnerable, you need to protect it. So it doesn't, if there's 10 or a thousand, that number is not critical. I, I hope that the growing community agrees, that, you know, knowing that they're in your orchard and the numbers are building, that's our action threshold. We don't, doesn't matter if it's a hundred or a thousand. Yeah. And we spent a lot, we have people spending an awful lot of time counting a thousand SWD in some locations as, yeah. the, as the season goes on. So yeah. So I think, I think the interesting thing, and Chris and I've talked about this and he may correct me, but we're thinking about putting more traps out in orchards. Is that correct, Chris? That's my thinking. As long as everyone's on board is if we can reduce the time spent at the microscope, you know, positively counting every single female and do more of a kind of a quick and dirty, you know, that these are definitely, there's SWD here. Here's an estimate, you know, greater than a hundred. We've well surpassed the action threshold. I think it'd be more informative if we could increase the number of orchards that we're getting to and decrease the scope time. There's a trade-off, but I think it makes more sense for the group, the growing community to know, to get a more grain, a high resolution image of what's going on with SWD across the board. Because the, the growing, the conditions change from Mosher over to the Dallas. So, so that timing is gonna be a little bit different. So I'd, I'd like to get into more orchards. So as long as, yeah, people have opinions, strong or otherwise, and then they want to send them to me on email, I'll definitely take it under consideration. I'm just trying to be more useful to the growing community. And if we can get to more places, I think that's that's more important. Yeah, yeah. I We've been talking about this for quite a while and I think it would be a, a positive change, but please, if you don't like us or don't like it, let us know. <laughs> if you don't like us, <laughs> follow your mom's <laughs> advice, <laughs> be nice. No, if, yeah, so I'm trying to refine this method and, and make it more efficient, more useful to the growers. I think it was a good system in the beginning to put these in suburbs and backyards and wild blackberry patches, but I don't think that's helping us make management decisions. So I, I want to kind of shift gears and 
pivot towards uh, more decision tools. So Chris, we had another question. Yeah, we have another question about Codling Moth. So you are the head of the Codling Moth Task Force and you didn't really talk about that at all. I was, yeah, so. Um, so I was, I, so I definitely volunteered to be part of the task force and kind of listen in. And then I ended up being nominated as chair of the executive committee. So, um, so yes, I'm, I don't want it to be all consuming, but I, I would like to do some coddly mouth work. I've got a lot of experience with trapping and monitoring, estimating populations, mating disruption, et cetera, um, sterile insect technique. So I'm trying to be um, useful to the Washington Tree Fruit Research Commission and lend my expertise. Um, and it does have some application here in pear orchards because it was established well before me, um, Helmut Riedel and, um, you know, Peter Shear, Peter Shear and Peter Westergaard identified a long time ago that if you can use mating disruption and be soft on coddling moth um, to allow your natural enemies to build. You can save a ton of money by letting natural in if you come in hard and do a, a, a heavy spray for early season coddling moth eggs, you disrupt your natural enemies. Then you're forced to take three or four more sprays um, to control Scylla. And then after those sprays um, impact spider mites, <clears throat> uh, you know, beneficial spider mites, then you're locked into three or four sprays for spider mites at the end of the season. And it just creates this terrible cycle. It was described in detail and, and Peter Westergaard put dollars and cents to, to those actions. So yes, I, I would like to get back out there and make sure that we're doing mating disruption for codling moth um, in an efficient area-wide uh, way so that we can be soft on parasilla control early and let natural enemies do most of the work. Uh, the math is there. It's been worked out before I got here. I just want to kind of preach to the choir and kind of reinforce the, the steps needed to, to keep these smart, use these management tools in a smart way and avoid getting resistance to, I mean, spider mites and Scylla have already been documented to develop resistance really quickly. So, so there's, there's a, if we are smart about it and we do coddling mouth control in a smart way, it benefits parasilla control. But, you know, that, a lot of this stuff has been established well before I got here. Steve Castagnoli did a great job. He got an area-wide program here all through D flat and in the valley and I'd like to get out, talk to growers and make sure we're keeping that going. And if we can keep an area wide mating disruption program established and that'll help Paracilla and spider mites and everything else. That was a so, long winded answer to a simple question, but. Do you yes. have any, do you have any tips for uh, mating disruption this year? Something I noticed in one of the orchards that I have a research plot in is that they were not hanging uh, they were not hanging their mating disruption uh, things in the correct location. So they were not in the top third of the tree. Yeah, so I, I hope to just do more of these extension talks and get back to basics. Um, and I, again, I, I just want, I don't want to take credit for being the smartest guy around. This is stuff that was established well before I got here. I just want to make sure that we're all, we're not forgetting the basics. So hand applied in the top third of the tree, um, applied early before um, trees leaf out um, is the best at 400, 400 dispensers per acre is the best has, has shown to be the, the most effective mating disruption technique and has the longest track record of success. Pe I see that people are moving to aerosol emitters and I get it. Um, it's easier, it's faster, but um, the mode of action and the way that that works is different and that hasn't really been fully explored. Peter McGee, Dr. Peter McGee at, out of the Goot Lab while I was there, kind of looked at how that worked and published a couple of papers. Um, but it's, it's a different, it changes the dynamics, it changes how you need to monitor, 
changes your action thresholds. All those things require further research to really fully vet that system and how we react to building populations. So th there's a there's a lot that we can that we can still understand about aerosol emitters. I, you know, I'd like to partner with maybe Tiana, uh, or I'm sorry, Tia Smith out there. She, her and I have been talking. She likes those aerosol emitters, but um, how they work and how they change the system is is still kind of open for discussion. So yeah, thanks for prompting me, Ashley. It's I, I, I would recommend for the group down here, stick with full rate, 400 dispensers per acre, hand applied, I think is, is a better choice than aerosol emitters. But I know there's a labor cost involved and I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that, but w there's more research that needs to be done on how best to apply aerosol emitters. I think that the one of the things that they're finding in Washington is when they got, when they, Jay Bruner did an area-wide program, he did a great job and they got numbers really, really low. And then once you have low populations, you can do different things. You can do half rate, you can do aerosol emitters and still get good control because your numbers are so low. But I don't, it doesn't really mean that it's working at the same level as hand applied at 400 per acre. Um, and now that numbers are building, the Washington group obviously needed to put together a task force to try to understand what's going on. So that's one of the things that I, I hope to work with some of the watching growers and try to help them figure that out. But, but my number one focus is Oregon Paracilla pear growers. For, for the, uh, for that part, for that portion. Yes. So I, I'm, I'm not, yeah, I, I want to, I definitely want to help. I want to, I don't want to get, um, pulled away from the cherry and pear growers down here, but but I, I think it's definitely, there's a large uh, group of people who can benefit from some small improvements. There. So hopefully we're just gonna kind of get back to basics there too and tweak the system. Does anybody else have any questions for Chris? So Chris, leaf hoppers and putting cards in trees to monitor for leaf hoppers. What what do you think? Um, I I don't know. To be decided. I, I it is clearly the most popular method. It's passive. It's easy. Um, but I still would like to understand: Do leaf hoppers choose to move? from the grass and the weeds and dandelions up into the cherries? Is there a physiological drive to, to, the, to their, what they're attracted to switch at some point during their development? That's still a big question mark. Or when you run a tractor and a lawnmower through, do they just jump out of the way of the tractor and end up in the trees by accident? And because they, will feed on just about anything? Do they end up feeding on cherry by accident because of mechanical uh, pressure, or, you know? Or are they, are they, if left to their own devices, would they move back and forth? And can we, mon can we capture that with our trapping? I don't know. Those are things I'm trying to figure out. Um, my data is kind of confusing. There's, when we did sweep netting, we catch a lot really early in the nets, but not in the sticky cards. So does that mean we're catching, we're catching more in the grass because they're in the grass by their choice and they're choosing not to be in the trees? Or does that mean, you know, they, it's, they don't need to be in the trees until summer when things start to dry out or mowing increases and uh, I, I just don't know. So for now, um, you know, and again, it's the same complication we have with SWD. There isn't really an action threshold. If you have an infected tree in your orchard, you need to seek help from the from your people who are picking and identify that tree early and cut that tree out. Because as long as it's there, it is a reservoir for phytoplasm and leafhoppers are feeding all year round. We're catching them well into October and November 
and they show up early, early in the spring, you know, before April. So leaf hoppers are always there. If you have a tree that's a sink for phytoplasm, then it's getting moved around in your orchard, taken from the tree down to the mallow and the dandelions and other weedy plants, and then back up into the next row and into those trees and you know, moving down the row. So right now you need to identify problem trees and get rid of those as fast as possible. And that has been proven by earlier papers in the 80s. Van Stenwick et al. published that, that of the two corrective measures, cutting out trees or trying to spray the heck out of the orchard, cutting out trees showed to be the most efficacious. So I'm trying to play a role. I don't think I'm going to find a silver bullet, but um, sticky cards seem to have a limited capacity to measure. And when we go through the sweep net, we catch 10 times as many we catch the key species earlier and later. So I like the netting, but um, I, I don't think that's everyone's recommendation. I, I, so I, I guess to be decided, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, I hate to sound like a flip-flopper, but it's too early to know how best, what species we're looking for, how early do you want to know they're there? What do we do when we see them? We can't spray every week year round for leafhoppers. So the normal things that an entomologist would bring to the table, which is understanding the phenology, trying to time life cycles, <clears throat> helping to time sprays, and then showing the efficacy of sprays, which Louis has done a good job of, of developing um, efficacies for different pesticides for both organic and conventional. Those are great, but they don't necessarily apply to this pest and this pathogen because um, if a tree is infected, it can be infected for a number of years before you even see it in the cherries. And then once you do see it, um, it needs to come out right away. And leaf hoppers have already been spreading it through your orchard for two to three years or more. It's much more complicated. It's not a clean system like codling moth, which has two distinct generations and we can time for egg laying. And this is just a, a messy system. So it's a great question, Ashley. I, I'm trying to figure out for myself, what species am I really looking for? How early do I want to catch them? What's an action threshold? And so it, all of that still has to be developed. Um, and it's, it's a painful process because trees are being cut down in orchards and I, you know, I, I want to give people some kind of uh, light at the end of the tunnel and, and an action threshold and a timing when you can do that best, you know, spray and, and knock down the population, but none of that is going to be um, forthcoming in the, for the next couple of years, I don't, I don't think. So we have one more question for you, Chris. Um, are, is there anything that a homeowner can do for brown marmorated stink bugs, specifically in apples and peach? Anything that a homeowner can do? Um, I, there are, I think there are some, uh, it's just on a website I, through or OSU extension where they have some kind of single tree rates um, for BMSB. But th there's, <clears throat> if you're growing, if you're just growing a fruit tree in the backyard, um, I, I wouldn't recommend trying to, to spray stink bugs because the, the list of the list of things that they'll eat is it's there's hundreds of different plants that they're interested in and they're a landscape level pest so they they can fly for kilometers so you spraying your tree doesn't do you any good if there's eating the tree of heaven uh you know invasive tree that's in the parking lot at the walmart and then they're moving to some tomatoes in the neighbor's backyard and then the wild blackberries in the ditch next to the highway. And then they show up in your tree to just feed for a day. Maybe they lay some eggs and then they leave the next day. Your spray doesn't do anything to kill that stink bug. You might knock down the eggs that she laid if you did something, but you, it's a landscape level problem. So we need to think of it as on landscape levels, not on a, a backyard tree. If, if you see a stink bug, catch it physically, squish it. But I, I am hesitant to try to recommend any sprays because that's the same problem we have in pears is 
if you see a couple of stink bugs, you don't necessarily want to get in the tractor and start spraying because the population is actually building someplace else and then they visit your fruit when it's vulnerable. Um, it's so my advice is don't do, don't take any corrective action other than you can buy some lures. Um, they're a little pricey, but they work for a really long time and put them in a jar and they'll show up. They really like that aggregation pheromone and squish them. But if you've got one fruit tree, just let it go. It's okay. Let's see something else came in here. Oh, just Dan thanking you for that. And um, before we go, I, I do want to let everybody know that the pest management guide should be available really soon. It seems like I've had some medical issues this um, fall and winter, and it seems like the copy editor and I can't seem to be at work at the same time. Um, so I submitted them to her and she's actually out right now. So I'm really hoping that it'll be done very soon. I know there's been a couple of you on this call that have asked me for it. So hopefully it'll be here soon, available online. And as soon as I get it, I'll send it out to you. But I, I do have a copy of it. It just has a couple really small corrections, like spelling errors and things like that, that need to be done. And then it'll be off to you guys. If you um, really need it and want it now and don't mind some spelling errors and things, shoot me an email and I'll, I'll send it to you. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks everyone for showing up and asking some questions. Please reach out to me if there's any other questions, comments, if I can come visit your orchard with a mask on and we can chat. Um, we're getting close to vaccination, so hopefully I get to meet everyone soon. Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it and we'll see you soon. <clears throat> Thanks, Ashley.